see we're talking about uh, changes to the human medicines regulations of 2012. Now, I welcome the implementation of the falsified medicines directive with a unique identifier and anti-tampering devices. I also welcome the change to allow <laughs> nasal naloxone to be used to deal with opioid overdose. Mm. But snuck in among those things that are perfectly reasonable is the serious shortage protocol. Now, this deals with prescription-only medicines and highlights what we are facing with Brexit coming in 11 days. 41 million packets of drugs a month go from the UK to the EU, and 37 million are imported in the other direction, including almost all insulin. The UK doesn't largely produce insulin. And the problem is there are many other drugs that the UK doesn't really produce. And we have raised the issues of radioisotopes previously and in yeah. this debate, yeah, although yeah. it clearly doesn't apply to this. There are also going to be issues with the supply chain of raw chemicals to actually produce drugs in the UK. Exactly. And yeah. things like batch testing at the end of the process for UK exporters into the EU because they will not recognise batch testing that isn't carried out inside the EU. One of the key words missing in the Withdrawal Act that appeared scattered throughout the Chequers deal, if we can call it that, is the word frictionless. You can do a word search and it isn't there. So while we are discussing this in the context of no deal, there will be issues regarding the supply chains in making drugs and moving drugs around, even if the government's withdrawal agreement went through. Now, bizarrely, in Clause 8 of the explanatory notes, it claims, and I quote, the SI does not relate to withdrawal from the European Union. Now, as what we would say in Scotland, aye, right. <laughs> but it goes on, if withdrawal from the EU was contributing factor to serious shortages of drugs, then the serious shortage protocol could be used. That is the thinnest fig leaf I have ever seen in my whole life. Now, it talks about the Minister being able to add drugs onto this serious shortage protocol list, or ministers. And I would be grateful if the Minister can clarify who she means by plural. Are we talking about the devolved ministers in Edinburgh, in Cardiff, or are we merely talking about all of the junior ministers and Secretary of State here in Westminster, because health is devolved and the use of drugs and indeed the diseases dealt with vary across the UK. And it is important that we are not seeing health being pulled back away from devolution. Yeah, yeah. So I would like that to be clarified, particularly when the Minister suggests this is not just a short-term solution, but is actually envisaged as a long-term solution for shortages. Now, I do accept there can be shortages. But they are normally quite small in number. It is normally possible to get access to information about what is causing them, and therefore it becomes easier to come up with solutions. But as has been said, this is only going to be reviewed in a year. That is quite a long time for this protocol to be in place. What replacements could be used would be useful to send to the GP or prescriber rather than to pharmacists. Why wait until the point of dispensing the drug if you know there's a national shortage of it? Tell GPs, tell non-GP prescribers. Don't leave it to the last minute when someone is in the pharmacy. Because that's the issue, is that this shortage protocol is giving pharmacists the power to override the prescriber. That's predominantly a GP, but not necessarily a GP. Now, they can change the strength, not the dose, I would say to other members. It does not say changing the dose. It says changing the strength. So if someone is on a 10 milligram tablet and they're used to taking one 10 milligram tablet, they may be given two 5 milligram tablets. Now, that may seem very innocuous. But an elderly or vulnerable or slightly confused patient who knows they take one tablet every morning yeah. may end up taking half the dose they require. Even worse if they had to be given a larger dose that they were meant to cut in half, yeah. because that's much more complex. 
so that the number of tablets they have to take could cause confusion. It talks about quantity. At the moment, patients are usually given eight weeks of a prescription, and they pay a prescription charge. So if they're only going to get four weeks of their medication, will they get the second four weeks without paying another prescription charge? Or is this actually going to double prescription charges for patients? That isn't an issue for us in Scotland, but it's certainly an issue here in England. It talks about... Happily... My honourable friend uh, was speaking very knowledgeably about dosage, and for particular people, um, yeah. and many of my constituents are on methadone prescriptions, they need to get that amount um, of prescription, and it can have very real consequences for relapse and for how they're able to live their lives. Would she agree, to me, agree with me that there has to be particular protections put in place for groups for whom removing the dose could have very, very severe consequences? Yeah, yeah. Good point. I, I think it is critical that the patient's yeah. dose is not changed and is not put in danger because the management of any condition is dose sensitive. We can't go down to homeopathic doses of antibiotics or blood pressure, blood pressure medication. That would just be absolutely crazy. They can give a different form, liquid, solid, capsule. Again, for some patients that may not be a problem, for others it will. Or generic, as the Honourable Lady opposite for uh, Newton, Abbott. Newton Abbott mentioned, some patients. Now, generally, NHS prescribers use generic as default to save money. But I've had patients for whom the generic form of tamoxifen gave them appalling side effects where the non-generic brand didn't. So there always has to be that right for GPs to say, actually, in this case, I will use brand. But the most important bit of this is that it allows a change to a completely different drug. Now, this may be a drug that's advised by a panel sitting somewhere in London with the colleges who say that's a reasonable replacement for the other drug. But it doesn't take into account that patients are all individuals. And I can tell you, they are all individuals. Yeah, yeah. Pharmacists are very knowledgeable, and in Scotland we've had community pharmacists for over a decade, and they contribute massively, but they work to their own protocol. They work within limits, and they do not have access to the patient's notes. So they cannot see that the patient has been on this drug in the past and had terrible side effects with it. So they are going to replace with this protocol drug, but as has been said, What about the responsibility? And why is this happening right now? This suggests to me that actually the Department of Health are expecting massive shortages to the point where the simple act of picking up the phone and speaking to the GP and saying, I don't have drug A, would drug B be reasonable for Mrs Smith, is somehow considered impractical. And I find that very worrying. It may be that Mrs Smith has actually had six drugs to control her blood pressure. Drug 2 and drug 5 caused her to faint or take blackouts. The pharmacist doesn't know this. Epileptics have been mentioned. The issue with epileptics is any change can destabilise their epilepsy. They are therefore never prescribed by generic. They are prescribed by brand to avoid precisely that. It's a very good point, and would she also agree that it's often the interaction between epilepsy drugs and other drugs that that patient may be on, and any interruption to that uh, relationship may also cause real problems? The Honourable Gentleman makes a a very good point, but actually that also applies to many drugs. When we are prescribing, we are sitting looking at interactions. Now, I would expect the pharmacist to be looking at that. They will have the patient's full prescription, and therefore they should be able to look at interactions. They don't have patient records. But that's the key thing. They do not have the patient's records, and they do not know what problems it may have caused in the past. With regards to epilepsy, this change could have real impact. It brings the danger of a fit. The fit itself may be a threat to them. Obviously, epileptics can suffer from sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. They are exposed to that. They can suffer from trauma, depending on where they are when they take the fit. And even just simply the loss of their driving licence for a year 
because they had one fit. The social impact of that on epileptics is absolutely enormous. Now, it says in the explanatory notes that because of this, epileptic drugs and biological drugs would not be considered suitable for the protocol. But it doesn't say that in the SI. They are not excluded. And I think that it is important that these people have the protection. I'll give way. I'm really grateful to the Honourable Lady, um, and I've been listening closely to what she's been saying. Can I say it's already happening? A friend of mine um, went to her chemist to pick up some drugs. The uh, dosage was halved by the pharmacist, not by her doctor. And she's ne- she had enough drugs to keep her going to go and see the doctor again, who reinstated the original drug. I just think it's really scary at the moment. People just don't understand why this is happening, because it can't be about Brexit, because it's, it's now. Yeah, I'm just coming on to that issue. Uh, I would reiterate, reiterate again, I would imagine it's the strength rather than the dose. Yeah. So she would be expected to take two smaller tablets, not to reduce her dose. As I've said, the obvious thing in this would be sharing the protocol with the prescribers, not aiming at it at the pharmacists right at the end of the process. Why is it that we are seeing these shortages now? Well, it's a simple thing. There are two ways to stockpile. Either you can force increased production, not necessarily within the gift of the Department of Health or even the Secretary of State, or within normal production, you can set aside some of those drugs. And I have to say, when I talk to my GP friends, they talk about a massive surge in shortages over the last nine months. And that coincides almost exactly with the acceleration of stockpiling. And so my concern is that drugs are being set aside into the stockpile, but are causing shortages right now. There should be publication of the list of drugs that are at risk of shortage, so that a GP can actually look and think, well, for this lady or this gentleman, it's not that important. So if this is a shortage drug, I won't use it. But for this other patient, I will have to use it. But apparently that's currently hidden behind commercial sensitivity. I think it is important that basically consultation and impact assessment is carried out. I was shocked that the BMA was given a week to respond to this and the General Medical Council were not even consulted at all. This totally reverses medical and prescriber legal responsibility. So who is legally responsible? Yes, responsible? How do the pharmacists feel about the fact that they yeah. might be held answerable for changing the drug? Or is the government going to underwrite that? So I think that it has been basically that this has been appallingly handled and has been snuck in with no scrutiny and no debate. The membership, member for Leicester South talked about cost and time saving for GPs and secondary to that the impact on patient safety. If you look at the basis for the review in a year it says number one will be on the function of the market and number two will be the impact on patients. So again we see that patient safety is not being put at the heart of this. This is not properly thought through, particularly if it is envisaged as a long-term solution to shortages of drugs. This no deal should now be off the table last week. There should be time to look at this properly, consult properly, and come up with something that will not endanger patients. Oh, Oh. (laughs) Norman Lamb. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I very much agree with the concerns that have been raised by the SNP spokesperson. Um, A general point, first of all, (coughs) I I recognise that this is not being introduced purely for no-deal planning, but clearly there is a recognition that the risk of shortages increases in a no-deal scenario. And it just seems to me that it absolutely beggars belief that there were cabinet ministers in this government willing last Thursday to purposefully vote against an extension and in favour, therefore, of the risk of a no deal in just a few days' time, knowing that the 